If you ever thought about getting a successful mentor or coach and you actually want me, Spectacular Smith, to actually coach you and become your mentor, I'm actually so excited about releasing my online school, Spectacular Academy, where I'm actually going to teach you live once a month different skill sets that's actually going to help you change your life for the better transformational information that I'm going to give you guys access to. I have a formula to success that every single company that I ever touched turned into gold. And I have over 14 companies. Okay. And all of them have the same type of success. So I want to teach you everything that the school system should have taught you. You know, everything that I know and how I built these fast growing companies and these award winning companies and show you real curriculums that I'm going to break down. You're going to have access to me. I'm going to be live in the chat rooms. I'm going to be live in the Facebook groups and personal communities that I'm going to give you guys access to of like minded entrepreneurs. So you're not by yourself on this mission. Not only you have me as a coach and a mentor, but you actually have your peer to peer people that's going to push you and root for you on the way to the top. Guys that's on the same exact weight limp that you are on and want the same exact results because my game plan is to change the way the school systems teach and teach you the things that need to make an impact in your life. Things that's going to be a high ticket skill that you can use forever where you don't never have to worry about going broke or not eating at night because once you learn how to market and brand yourself then you can eat for a lifetime you get access to my team and everything if you want to go to my free training just to get a sample of the things that's going to be in my program you can actually go to specmentorme.com or i'm gonna put it in the bio only take a certain amount of people every single month so reserve your seat and do not procrastinate because you might just miss out. Now let's get to the podcast. What's up, everybody? This is Spectacular Smith, and welcome to the Spectacular Experience. As you can see, I have another very special guest with me today, none other than Spectacular Smith. Uh, this guy is one-fourth of the legendary group Pretty Ricky, uh, responsible for a lot of good times in my childhood, a lot of uh, things I probably can't talk about now, but I, but I thank you for them. Um, but, but even bigger than that today, there's been a lot of impact he's made in, in making that transition from music to legitimate entrepreneur is something that so many musicians have struggled to make. And as many of you guys know who are musicians, um, it's hard enough to just be become a successful musician. So we're going to talk about a lot of those good things, but without further ado, welcome. What's up, Spectacular? What's up, man? Not much, not much, man. I appreciate you doing this, man. Um, just first and foremost, I just want to get a little bit into that beginning, that backdrop, right? So obviously, so many people will uh, know you just as a part of being a, um, a part of Pretty, Rick, Pretty Ricky. But how old were you when that, that all blew up again? So when I first got into the group Pretty Ricky, I was I was in middle school. Yeah, I was in middle school and, um, and pretty much just my father wanted me to join the group because I used to be in the dance group. All I really cared about, like when I was actually performing and stuff back in the day, it was basically just performing with, you know, on the stage. Like I just wanted to be in the dance group and just dance and have fun and had a lady scream. And then my brothers and them, they want to actually get into this rap group. They created a rap group called um, the Mavericks and they wanted me to, my father wanted me to join the group. He was like, well, you on the stage dance with all these other people, like get on the stage and dance with your brothers. I didn't know how to rap at the time. So that wasn't something that it was, um, that they wanted me to do. I, I didn't rap at all, but then one of the producers named Jim Johnson, um, who produced the whole first album, blue star album. And he was basically saying like, Hey, let, Spec get a verse on the song. So I was like, all right, cool. I mean, I don't know how to rap or nothing, but I get a verse. And they gave me the one verse on the song. And 
I performed it and all the ladies went crazy. So from that point forward, he was like, I right, put spec on all the songs now. <laughs> so we went back and redid the whole album and they stopped putting me on the, put me on all the songs and I taught myself how to rap. And pretty much from there, we just kept making singles and putting, releasing them and going out and street teaming and doing everything we had to do perform to actually build on the brand and blow ourselves up. Mm. Well, so, so how long were you a part of it? Uh, uh, yeah, from the time that you guys like really hit with that project, what was the, what was y'all's first hit thing? Was, was that grind on me or was it something before that? I can't remember. Yeah, so if you are, it depends on how much of a fan you are, Pretty Ricky, right? So if you was a fan of Pretty Ricky from day one, then our first single was called Flossin. Okay. And it was, it hit the airwaves, it went crazy, and it was building from there. And that's when we got our first hype from. So back then, it wasn't no Twitter, Instagram, and all that stuff out back then. So we literally had to perform, perform, perform. We performed at one show. Somebody that was there was like, hey, I want you to perform at my event. Somebody that was at the event that we performed at next was like, oh, I want you to perform at our event. So we kept getting shows, 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 bookings. And then we ended up with two shows a day, some days, sometimes three shows a day. We hit like two cities at one day just to do two shows. So pretty much we just really just start building from there, man. And, and, um, and the song just really pretty much took off and started getting played on the radio. And then that's when we started doing Grind On Me and we created the record and we performed at a place called Hollywood Horror in Miami with Power 96. And things just kind of took off, man, from there. Like they started playing it once a day in the love hour, it started at 9 p.m. And then everybody started calling and requesting it. Please play that song. Please play that song. And it broke the record of the number one requested record in the history of the radio station. And they was forced to play it. And then yeah. things just kind of took off from there. And after that, CEO Craig Calman came down from Atlanta Records and he was like, well, I want to sign somebody from Florida. Who's the newest thing? Like, who's the best thing to pop next? And it was like, well, you got to meet these guys pretty Ricky. And we met with the CEO and we met him in a hotel room and he asked us to perform. And my father taught us, like, when it's time to go, it's time to go. And he was like, all right, cool, perform. We grabbed forks, knives, and we just went crazy right in front of us, right in front of him. He was like, yo, I'm trying to sign y'all right now. Yeah. He whipped out paperwork. He was like, yo, I'm trying to sign y'all right now. My dad was like, oh, hold on, wait, wait, wait. And uh, we got the paperwork together and signed to Atlanta Records and, and pretty much took off. Jeez. Dang. That's what's up. I didn't realize that y'all had dropped that single before getting signed. That's That's interesting. Yeah, we, we dropped. That's the reason why we got signed, because the song was the number one song on the, on the radio at the time in Miami. And it started spreading throughout the nation and everybody started picking it up and playing and we started charting. Then everybody was like, damn, who the hell? Who the hell is this group? So when he met up with us, we already had history. You know, actually, Jive Records offered us way more money, like two point five million more than what we was actually getting offered. And my my pops turned it down to go with Atlanta Records. So okay. off a handshake. He felt like Craig came down. He had the interest. Everybody else was just phone calls. Mm -hmm. And Craig came down, met with us, and it was more more interest there for my for my old boy, and um, which old boy stand for dad? Just in case you ain't from Florida, <laughs> but yeah. So that's how I went, and we you know God knows like if we would have went with Jive Records, who knows if we would have been bigger or we even would have got shelf. I don't know. I'm pretty satisfied the way things went with Atlanta Records. So who knows? Sometimes it ain't about the money. It's about the passion and the, and the team that's behind you that believe in you. I'm interested in that because, like, where you are now and having to be a leader in your business, right, how, how much do you look at people in terms of, you know, uh, how they carry themselves, the passion, th those things that you mentioned versus actually delivering. Like some people, they just love a certain specific area of of business, but then they might not necessarily follow up with actually being able to deliver with it. And then when you take certain principles and values, like uh, like what you said, like with the dead, you know, off of a handshake and the fact that you came down here, like how much does all do all of those type of principles uh, play into the way you go throughout business? For me, I look at 
numerous of things when I decide to do business with you or I'm hiring employees. Well, my team is really about learning. You got to be a learner. If you like, there's no such thing as I'm, I'm good. Like there's no such thing. We always want to go from good to great and then from great to unstoppable. And a lot of, a lot of times people don't even understand their greatness. So I make sure that the person who I'm hiring see at least have the potential to get there and have the mindset to get there. So that's number one. You got, you have to have the mindset. You have to be willing to learn. You have to be willing to help out. You have to be willing to give back to the community because it's not all about us at the end of the day. It's not about money. We're a fast growing company. So money is no issue to us. We got a literally a waiting list for people who wants to partner with us and, and hire us to run their social media and monetize their social media, you know, paying us from 5k all the way to 25k a month just on a monthly retainer. And then we got some campaigns from 35 K, you know, the six figure campaigns once a month. So we, we get tons of tons of people that want to work with us. So we make sure that the people who are involved, my team, we make sure that they have those different things checked off, you know, always learning, always testing, always willing to change, you know, things, change all the time in the social media industry. So if you're not, if you're not cool with change, then you kind of like shooting yourself in the foot because things change all the time. And if you one of those people that you get flustered and like things hit the fan and you're like, Oh my God, you panic, then you might not be great for my team. So we, we really come in, focus on certain things and focus on the people we like and the products we like, the people we like. You might not even have a huge product, but you might have a great story. Or you might have a great product, but no story, and we can help you build your story. So it's different things. So just like when it comes to my team, I look at certain things. When it comes to doing business with people, I have to like you. Like, I can do business with a million people. I get opportunities through to me thrown to me every single, literally every single day, somebody is DMing me about something or, or walking up to me, asking me about something when I'm doing speaking engagements, yeah. they're asking me about certain things and, and partnering this, investing in that. So it's really about me connecting with you as an individual and me connecting with you as a, a person who's, who's doing things in a community or, or people who's doing certain things that's going to better the world or, just somebody who's just a genuine good person because if you're an asshole, I still, I just, I mean, <laughs> I'd rather not, I'd rather not deal with the headache because it's so much money. It's money everywhere. You can, I know people getting rich off of selling socks. I know people getting rich off of rich off of selling um, bracelets, you know, cars, crypto. Like, I mean, it's a million ways to make money. So I pick and choose on what I believe in and what I like and the people I like and I invest in people. Oh, dope. I can respect that for real because I, I definitely understand. Like, have, especially if you don't have to, but yeah, there's so many ways to get it. Why deal with certain headaches? Mm-hmm. So, just to rewind for a second to make it even clear for, um, for those watching how you even got into where you are now. Because I've, I've heard you talk, tell that story as far as like Twitter, right? You starting mm-hmm. there and not even know you can make money for, for, um, from it at first. Like, how did you actually decide, okay, I'm going to make money off of this thing and I'm going to actually cap off of it too? Twitter, so at the time it was 2009 and I was on tour. I just got off a tour, but I was on tour back then also. And it was the late night special tour. And one of my colleagues named Maddie J hit me up trying to get a referral fee off a company called my likes, which is now bought out. So don't do the research trying to go get some money. <laughs> and they got bought out by Uber and Amazon, but I was, you know, he hit me up and told me that I could make money off of tweeting. And I felt like it couldn't be none easier than that. You know, I was on stage yeah. all day and sleepless nights in the studio. I felt like that was super easy to do. So I was like, all right, cool. Let me figure it out. And at the time, I had like 50,000 followers, but I felt like in order for me to really make some serious money, like I got to I gotta expand this. I got to scale this thing up and I can't, I couldn't scale it with my own personal brand. I couldn't create a hundred spectacular accounts or pretty Ricky accounts. Mm-hmm. So I just started thinking of creative ways I can grow a massive following, which was different fan accounts, parody accounts, 
So all those parody accounts you see on Twitter and all that, like I was one of the first parody accounts ever. So I really created the whole parody theme and really creating the, um, the, the role playing accounts acting like, you know, I was the celebrity and things like that. And people started following because the real Will Ferrell not worried about entertaining everybody all day. Mm. But me, I was because I had incentive. You know, the more followers I was making, the funnier I was. People want to follow me. And then when I post ads and traffic sold against the ads, uh, I mean, ads sold against the traffic, I'm able to make some money. So I had, a, I had an incentive. Say that again? You got a fake Will Ferrell account? Oh my God. I had Will Ferrell, Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt. I had Cat Williams, Eddie Murphy, Jim Carrey. I had pretty much everybody. If you was hot, I jumped on the page. I created it. I grew all my followers up to 6 million followers. Twitter decided to delete me because they felt like they felt like I was impersonating people and things like that. So they deleted all my accounts and I had to start from scratch. And uh, they was like, oh, you got to put parody in the bio so people know you're a fan account. I was like, all right, whatever then. So I put, <laughs> I put parody in the bio. So now if you see all these parody accounts on Twitter, it's because of me that they got to put parody in the bio. Wow. And then I blew it up to like 4 million followers again. And then, um, yeah, and then I started making money. So I was basically top five on Twitter. Like I was literally number one almost every single day. And every single time you hit number one on my likes, you get like $150. So I was literally making probably like an extra like four, three to four thousand dollars a month just off of being number one. Number two got fifty dollars. Number one got one fifty. And they had a leaderboard where you can see who was making what money. And I was always number one. You know, sometimes I'd be number two and then I go hard. Like it's like what? I'm down by two hundred dollars. I go hard, make an extra two hundred dollars at the end of the day just to hit that number one spot. Yeah. Dang. Wait. So how exactly do they judge? Uh, who who becomes number one and how they get get the money? So they had a they had a basically a whole system that tracked everything. So once you post on social media, post the link or some articles or something, and then once you post the link, the people who click on the link, you get paid off of it. So oh. they had a leaderboard. So every it was over a hundred thousand people in the database, and okay. whoever was making the most money was on the top hundred leaderboard. Got gotcha. you. And I was always number one. It was it was me. Uh, Matty J. It was a guy named uh, Kevin Gidham, and then it was another guy named uh, your favorite white guy. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember a couple of those names. Now that's funny, but I just you know you see them on social media. You didn't actually uh, like actually process it and think of it as a real person for real, for real. That's funny. But I, I'm hearing something interesting though, man, because you're like that same thing that made you say, "I am number two right now. I want to be number one." actually alludes to something that I was curious about because the fact that you were already successful in music, right? And like some people don't understand. It's like, oh yeah, you pe- you posting memes and all this kind of stuff, growing a fake page, but that junk is like real work. Like for real, for real work. Yeah. So what had you doing that? Like as opposed to just, and yeah, like what had you for real going that hard while you're already successful to the point where, you know, you don't have to you don't necessarily need need money at the time. What happened? Mm. What, what, why were you doing it? I mean, I just, it was just another thing to conquer. Mm. Really, that's it. I mean, everything that I do in life, I want to be top five, if not number one. You know, you talk about musicians and, and the bands that came out in our era. You have to put Pretty Ricky in top three, if not number one. That's how I feel. So, when I did the whole social media thing, I'm like, okay, cool. How can I become number one? So I started figuring out ways I could become number one and, and taking it serious. I take, I take everything in life. This, I approach everything in life the same way. It's like, you got to do the things that the people don't want to do to get what people don't have. And people didn't want to go and, and be on the computer for 12 hours a day. 18 hours a day on the computer all day. And my girl sometimes had to beg me to come to bed. Like, I was like, nah, every time I refresh, I made a hundred dollars. Like <laughs> I'm going crazy. So it was just, the, it was, it was addicting at times because how the money happened. Like you can literally post something, refresh, you make money. You could see the money growing, growing, growing. Yeah. So I just wanted to grow. And then it was fun. And then when Twitter started deleting all accounts and like banning all the parody accounts, they kind of took an L because once that had stopped, everybody was coming on Twitter for the parody accounts and trending topics. Like we had like five trending topics at one time 
And we the reason, me, me, Matty J, your favorite white guy, we had our own little squad. We the reason why they switched the way trending topics work. Because before, if something was trending, it actually trend. But now they started controlling what trends. And we was the reason, because we had like freaking five, six trending topics up at one time, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> dumb hashtags it's just like dumb hashtags it's like you know you mad when hashtag and then like everybody put like whatever behind it and it just goes viral so i had so many pages i was making things go crazy i had a grumpy cat page which pretty much took off once i created it and that blew up so like it was just a constant grind and and at the same time i had the incentive of making money and incentive of racing for the number one spot and I just approached it like that. Then it came a point where I just started taking other people pages. I was like, hey, I knew who the top five was, top 10, really. And I went to him like, yo, I'm number one. You ain't got time for this. I know you ain't got time for this. Let me actually run this for you. And I get a percentage. We split it. Like, you know, I take this amount. You take this amount. I'm going to run everything. I'm going to run your ads. I'm going to grow your page. And I was, I was automate. I automated all my accounts, all my accounts. So I was shooting out probably like 24 tweets on like 25 pages every single day, memes, everything. And I started recruiting other people. And that's really when I started, kind of started my business. I started running like 10, 15 accounts and everybody was making like three to five grand a week. And my pages was making like $50,000 a month. And we was just like, I just started killing it for everybody. And then that's when I thought like, hold up. If I could do these for fake parody accounts, I could do these for celebrity accounts. So that's what gave me the mindset to actually transition into the whole uh, celebrity space. You know, so once I actually got to a point, I was just like, yo, I need to make this transition. And then like anybody, you know how you procrastinate so much, you want to really take that step. But I kept waiting, waiting, waiting. And then I actually seen somebody doing my idea. I was like, hold up now. That's my idea. Like people start monetizing celebrity accounts. And I was like, hold up now. So the stuff I was doing on Twitter, people was doing on Facebook. I was just like, oh, oh hell no. Nah. So I kind of transitioned to Facebook after having a conversation with us, Sean Keaton and Soldier Boy. And made the transition after I seen somebody doing my stuff. And from that point forward, I kind of like, was like, yo, let me jump on this. And. I created a company around it. I moved to LA after this. And, and at this point, my father was handling all my funds as pretty Ricky. And I had this money coming in, but Twitter deleted all my stuff. I had to start over from scratch. So all my money went from all this money, basically millions, basically in revenue all the way to like zero within like a day, just flatlined me. And then my father was handling all my money in pretty Ricky. And he just made bad business decisions with the money left us flat broke from that and then i had to build i had to build up a company called sound exchange gave me 60 grand by mistake uh off of my royalties and it was like oh you know uh, can we get that money back and i was just like you ain't get nothing back. <laughs> i was like don't i have more money coming and it was just like yeah so i was like right, take it out of that and i basically took that 60 grand and that's what i started my company i was our wit and i started signing my first People, of course, I signed Soldier Boy. I went to sign Sean Kingston, and I started cutting checks up front, and became like the money man, and start monetizing their, their pages. And was like, you know what? This is a way that I can prove to you I'm gonna make money. I'm gonna put my money with my mouth. That boom, and I give them a minimum. Like I'm gonna make you guarantee every single month fifteen grand. And I put that in the contract, and I gave them money up front, and then I started working my way up. And now I, I ended up with over a hundred celebrities monetizing from day to day. Some guys make a 20 K a month, some guys make a 60 K a month and just start killing it for them. And I started my company from that money by mistake and turned it into millions. Hey man, that's dope. I didn't even know sound exchange was out here making mistakes like that. That's interesting. Did it? Oh, they took, they took an L. They took an L and then what make it so bad. My brother thought that, they overpaid me and underpaid him. So he called and he was like, yo, y'all underpaid me. And he was like, oh, it was a mistake. And that's how they found out they overpaid me. They was going to continue uh -huh. to pay me for the whole, for the whole group <laughs> every, <clears throat> every single month. And then, you know, he kind of said something and then they, you know, oh, dang. they figured it out. And then that's when they uh, said, oh, you owe us money. I owe you nothing. Y'all better recoup that. <laughs> yeah. So yo, that's crazy. I, um, like with what you're doing today, 
Like, obviously, those are beginnings. But how would you best say it looks like for Adwazar today? Because all right, you have these big celebrities, but can't anybody just sign up to pay for you guys' services? Have you split it off into different types of services? Mm -hmm. So we got a triangle. So our triangle is basically celebrities who have over a million followers. We help them monetize it. So now we kind of have a play with Instagram. So it drops down to like 500K now to start monetizing with us. And that's the whole monetization strategy. So we help you with video monetization, sponsor posts, you know, different ways to make money on social media. Then the next part of the triangle is actually helping those people who have a great story, have a great product. And we basically give them a sign team so they don't have to worry about doing anything. Cause a lot of people they're confused on where to go, where to start, or they feel like they, they got themselves to a certain level and they just plateau. Mm. So we help them with pairing them up with the right influencers to get their message out and the right strategy, proven strategy, 90 day strategy on, on figuring out what their go to message is to go to market with. And we help them launch it with content, viral content. And they get, we give them a whole social media team to either be a part of their team, or if they don't have a team, we become their team. And that part is like our growth X part of the program. And then we have our influencer marketing program where it's like these, these companies who want to use our celebrities, you mm. know, they like, well, spec, we know you got all these celebrities, like let us not only, use you to help grow our social media, but let us come in and use you guys to se help sell our product. So we started an influencer marketing leg of the company. And now we started helping different personality brands and, and companies from fortune 500 companies to startups, start launching their products and, and really get them going with like a minimum 35 K budget. They come in, they submit the budget and we do a campaign DNA where we basically figure out who's actually Who's actually the people who will want to buy from you? So we look at the influencers and we see who has a, a certain infinity score or a certain, you know, um, score that I can pull through my technology and find out who's the people who will actually buy from you. So like savings, if you're a Lyft, right, we can find the influencers that have a huge, huge demographic that loves Uber. 80% of their following loves Uber. So we'll find those different pages and then we'll put the offer in front a lift offer in front of them we know they love uber already uber never even promoted with this influencer so we come in and we go snag all uber influencers and uh, uber followers and customers off a campaign with lift and we kind of like built technology around it like that so we can really get to the masses and we use different celebrities to actually do it at the same time with using, you know, different paid media methods and, and running it through our technology. And then we realized that that triangle, that everybody couldn't be in that triangle. So what we did was not only we figured out a way to package everything up for the average person to come in and join our academy where we actually teach everything we do in that triangle. So we teach you you know, how to build your social media. We te teach you how to build content. We teach you how to do lead generation, marketing, leadership, credit, like all these different things that's actually going to help you build on your brand. Because I really thought about people in general and the things that people go through, go to college and they're in the debt, right? That you're in a hundred thousand dollar debt. You get out of college, you can't even find a job or you get out of college, you do find a job, but then the extra money you made, you went to college for to make extra money, you paying back in them student loans. So I just feel like it's a huge, a huge, huge, huge um, gap, you know? And I feel like it's, it's kind of scammy when it comes to college, right? And then I end up going to Harvard just to see what I was missing, right? And, fit, and and make sure I can take what I'm saying and make sure I can prove out what I'm saying. So I end up going, actually got my Harvard shirt on right now. But <laughs> but actually I went, to, I went to Harvard just to see what they was teaching and see what I can actually add in my program and some, some, some ways that they're teaching the teaching, teaching methods and, you know, figure out ways that I can help prove what I'm saying, right? Back up. And what I realized is, it's things that they're not teaching. Like in school, they're not teaching you how to manage your money. What's the difference between an LLC, a, a S corp, a C corp, taxes, credit, leadership, 
you know, things that you need to know to become successful in life. And they, they're not teaching that. So instead of being a person that actually complains about what's going on and not doing nothing, I'm an action-based person. Like if I have an issue or something, I come up with a solution in my company and life and relationships and business, everything. And I felt like this is a way not only to get people who can't afford that triangle that I was talking about earlier, but actually help more individuals, you know, get out of debt. When you join my program, you're not in all this debt. So at least you, you invest in yourself, but now you don't have to be in debt within the first two, three months, you're making money or you're growing your followers to get more credibility, more social proof to make more money. And we teach you all the skills to bring in, you know, all the revenue you want, as long as you're dedicated to your craft. And we have a million dumb teachers. So instead of professors, we actually have people who are killing it right now as we speak with million dollar companies, multi-million dollar companies, hundred million dollar companies, eight figures, six figures, seven figures. Like, and we have um, not even six figures, my bad. So is seven, seven, eight, and nine figure businesses. That was the difference. Like, all right, cool. Professors teaching, but are they doing the stuff that they're talking about right now in their own business? Like, I feel like if I want to become a fit person, like I want to go to a bodybuilder who already killing it, guy who won awards in bodybuilding, the guy who's number one, that's who I want to learn from and uh, get fit with and be my trainer and things like that. And I take the, I took the same approach with my academy. It's like, yo, these dudes are killing it. This guy is, you know, doing millions in revenue off his agency. This guy is doing $2 million. This girl does sales and she's, she did $1.2 million off her sales strategy. So everybody who's actually powerful in their niche and in their expertise, I got to teach that in my program. So it's called Ad was our Academy. That's my university. And then, um, the program that I'm pushing right now is my entrepreneur MBA program, which is entrepreneur uh, mastering, mastering business affluence, which stands for mastering business wealth and teaching everything you need to know to build wealth in the community and for your family. Dope. Yeah, that's, that's dope. So you really created your own college basically for real. Basically. Yeah. Dope. I always say that man, cause I like, I have a true, this is an ongoing thing with me. I've been wanting to reform education personally in some form or fashion for years just because the stuff in college, like you said, is not necessarily applicable or is so high level, right? Like even if you're in marketing, maybe it's changing today probably in some programs, hopefully. Marketing is the worst though. Is exactly. Because if you learn something three years ago and then you finally get out of school and apply it now, it don't work no more. Exactly. And it's, it's like it, when I was realizing that some people weren't even doing like Facebook ads and things like that in college, like, I mean, and, and that's pretty much how every, the, the, everything is moving outside of that. Exactly. Like, what are you teaching me? What, what am I learning? Why am I paying all this money to use something I can't even use? All you basically giving me is a is a degree that once I get to my workspace and they ask me to do a Facebook ad, launch a Facebook ad, I can't even do it. Man, I To me, Colleges at the end of the day are just a, are a brand, and you really just go on to flip the brand. Hopefully, you can flip that brand into some money, and it don't work exactly. Way. I think college is basically about networking. If you're not taking that approach and going to an Ivy League school, I feel like for networking, I feel like college is not. I think college is good to learn, right. But there's way better things out there right now on in the internet that can teach you way faster than college can and get you a, a, a result way fa- faster than college can. If you literally go and you study the top 10 books in your niche, right, and you go take the top 10 programs in your niche, it'll yep. probably take you six months to do so. And you will already be making money within the seven month and have more experience and the ability to generate wealth with that and listening to podcasts and reading blogs and, and other than being in college all day and, and like every single, every single week you at college and you in all this debt. And, and then those programs that you buy is probably going to cost what two, two grand a piece, five grand, get some mastermind groups. You like by time, by the time you spend 50 grand max, probably like even 20 grand, Probably like 20 grand max and some books and some masterminds. Like you're literally 25 grand and you way more influential than a person that went to college for four years. 100%, man. 100%. That's a, like, I, I think if a lot more people like just hear that snippet of what you just said and actually take that route, it'll be surprising on like the impact that they can have. 
but absolutely because listen if you take if you, like if you took 150 grand right if that's how much you owe in college and you took that 150 grand and you joined elite mastermind groups and you got into those mastermind groups for 25 grand mm -hmm. 25 grand you're around people who are making 10 million dollars 15 million dollars the shit they can teach you in those mastermind groups is unbelievable on the things that you can actually come together and not only network with these people but now you have access to these people and now you're able to do things that the regular college person couldn't do with a four-year degree that's just how I see it. So if you're not going in thinking about networking and building a relationship with the people that's in those Ivy League schools, I don't really see, I don't really see that being the most effective way, the most effective way to use your time. One hundred percent, bro. I, I agree, and I, you can tell you that from somebody who went to college, and I and I hated it the whole time I was there, but I was like, you know what, I did, I did it for my mom. But yeah, I, I agree one hundred percent, man. Um, there's something specific that you say and that your company says that I want to figure out how do you guys differentiate, right? So many people say that they can grow your, your uh, social media, but you guys specifically say we're the number one company for monetization through social media. What's mm -hmm. the difference in just growing social media and how you can just, and how you monetize social media. So we've been doing this for so long. I, I like, we figured out every single way to monetize. Like right now, video monetization is on steroids, right? I know guys who don't even have companies making hundred grand a month off of this. And this is all people was in my space. So when I put my hands on it, I'm going 10 exit every single time. So my team understands this world. We understand what makes money. We understand when a, when a trend is coming and we capitalize off the trend. You know, yeah. it was one trend off of Facebook, Facebook watch videos, you know, me and my team was making a million dollars a week off of three days, a million dollars. So it's like those different trends come and go, but we understand it so well, it's hard for people to compete with us. Mm. And we have so many people that's, that's inside of those trends we connected like we have so many of those guys working for my company so it's hard for you to compete so if you have a brand there's no way for us not to know how to monetize it so if it's e-commerce or if it's you know sponsor posts if it's ad breaks on facebook if it's whatever it is if it's selling programs funnels like we we take pride in really figuring out what's the next wave what's the new it and making sure that we're ahead of the curve at all times because things change all the time. Like one of my competitors would make a 45 million a year and just went out of business at a snap of a finger because they didn't see the change coming. And if you not, if you're in this business and you can't see the change coming before it comes, you're dead. And that's just how social media work. And you got to be ahead of the curve. And my team, we take pride in understanding what's going on and what's next. Interesting. That's so that's why you do so many things because you just realize I can't say, oh yeah, we do this one thing, even though you might be able to capitalize off of that one thing for a period of time. You, like you said, 40 you might make $45 million just doing one specific or a few specific parts types of um cap monetization. But if that trend changes, then yeah. I think I think for me it's just everything really goes together. So celebrities need sponsors so that's influencer marketing okay. and people who want to be celebrities need a machine behind them to make them celebrities so it just go hand in hand it's just a big triangle and then the celebrities themselves they need to grow their following even more and they need money from advertisers so like everything goes together and then i just realized that school system is broke and then the things that i'm doing for my company other people can utilize the skill set and instead of me just coming in and teaching i have my team teaching and other millionaires successful friends and mentors teaching also so right. it's like something i can i can change the way people teach and learn and change the way the culture is is looked at you know and because now you have these different skill sets that you have to offer that other people don't so that's that's my game plan. That's how I look at things. Got you. Now I got two primary questions that I'd like to end with. 
the first one is what's the difference between being an entrepreneur and a musician? Hmm. I mean, I definitely think it all depends. It's, it's, it's two type of musicians. You have musicians that's all artsy and all they care about is the craft. And then you have the musicians that understand the business. Nice. So the ones who's just all artsy and like musically and all that type of vibe of, of what they consider themselves as, they're more of, it's really more like of, of a puppet, honestly. It's like, you know, when, when somebody decides to pull your screens and make you jump or whatever, like you really at the next person beck and call. It's, it's up to, to them unless you really, well, you still got to know the business is hard. So the, anybody who's just 100% on the creative side is like, I feel for them because it's not longevity. You got to wait for somebody to do stuff for you, right? Yeah. Some, some, some pull it off, but majority of the people don't. So you'll see somebody like Spike, like they have this huge career and then they just flatline and you never hear from them again. Or they have this huge career and then the label decide they don't want to deal with them no more. They cut them off, drop them from the label and you never, they never make a comeback. Mm. Versus the artists who understand the business, they might have a huge spike and they end up signing somebody else and now they got a huge spike and like it lives on like that. Or the people who did make that huge spike, they took advantage of the relationships of the business and they set themselves up for, for a bigger, a bigger uh, future. So I would definitely say for the uh, entrepreneur side, it's kind of the same thing. It's like you always got to reinvent yourself. You always got to be creative. You always got to figure out how to touch the people. It's like it's the same thing. Right. And just becoming better and better every single day. Like if you look at everybody who's successful in music as a musician, they all jumped into the entrepreneur side. If you look at Rihanna right now, she's killing it off of her cosmetics. You look at Jay-Z, he just hit a billion dollars. If you look at everything, I went and analyze everything he's doing. I'm like, oh, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, I'm doing that. I was like, I'm on my way. If you look at if you really break down what Jay-Z did, right? He took his music stuff, he just didn't throw it to the side. He's like, all right, you know what? I'm doing concerts. And I'm getting paid peanuts from the promoter. Even if I get paid a million dollars, they're making $20 million. So why the hell am I getting a million dollars just to perform? So let me come in on a partnership and partner with Live Nation. And then once I partner with Live Nation, learn it in and outs. And then from that point forward, I can launch my own stuff. So he ended up doing that. And then he ended up signing other artists and creating an agency part of it where now he's he's representing sports talent. He's representing artists. And he said, listen, if you want to go on tour, I'm assigned to exclusive agreement. And now I get to make all the money. I cut you the check and now I'm the promoter. So this is all stuff that's in the works for me. So the same thing. So boom, you got Rock Nation put to the side. And then you have next is his streaming platform, digital, a digital product which is my digital product, which is my academy. So he has his digital product. I have my digital product. His is streaming. Mine's is education. Then the next thing you look at is a product, do say, and then Ace of Spade. So a physical product. Right now, I'm in the process of launching a physical product. It's not done yet. So I don't like to talk about stuff until it's done, ready to launch. But I can basically take the place of a physical product and just say, hey, I got my agency, which is not really a scalable model. So that's why it's good to actually have a, a product, mm -hmm. right? So instead of actually having a physical product, I just got a, um, I just got multiple digital products for right now until I launch my physical product. And then you have a huge real estate portfolio. So same thing, real estate, rent, current revenue, passive income, boom, that's done. So it's like everything that he did, I'm pretty much doing the same thing, right? And he had a bigger, he had a a better chance to really scale his up faster because he had his record label that took off and he took all that revenue that he earned from that, which was millions. And he re he did the right thing with his money, 4040 Club, and he created partnerships and, and he really like, he's smart as hell. And, and he really took advantage of his money versus the normal, guy who's on the artist side don't do that they go buy cars and chains and and all this stuff instead of investing me i started from a sixty thousand dollar sound exchange check you know and turn it into millions within a year so i'm on a it's a slower bill for me 
um, versus comparing me to Jay-Z, the way he really just took off and made the decisions he made. But honestly, you really just one decision, one partnership away from blowing the hell up. And I understand that. It's about products and it's about digital products. I mean, di physical products and digital products. You look at Dr. Dre, he had the beats. He did the, the deal, I think it was Harrell, what his name was. Whatever the executive name was, he did the deal with Beats. They got bought out for like $3 billion or something like that. And he made all his money, not off of music. He took his, yeah. he, he took his name and likeness and he turned it into a business venture. And he took advantage of it. It was a product and blew the hell up. Boom. Now he's close to a billionaire. You know, so all these things is based on products. Diddy, like I could do that. I could talk about this all day. Everything is based on products and digital. And then you have some some form of like agency model or things like that. So, mm. yeah, my billion coming soon. Trust me. <laughs> I love the fact that you are truly like studying it and, and not just seeing yeah. one thing and say, let me go do that thing. Trying to trying to catch a wave that's already done. Like, oh, this person has liquor. Now let me get liquor. No, oh, no, 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 no. Product. So, you know, like that's dope. Yeah, so what, what I got taught from one of my mentors is if everybody is jumping on it, stay away from it. Mm -hmm. And my mentor I'm talking about is Warren Buffett, and not because I know him personally, but because I study him as a mentor. Just because you don't know somebody personally don't mean they can mentor you. So I, I listened to him. He's like, listen, if everybody jumping on it, stay away from it. Like even when he buy his real estate or, or if he buy his investments, if everybody jumping on something, that's when you stay away. And then when everybody running, that's when you go towards it. So yeah. It was like when the when the when the when the market crashed in two thousand and nine, everybody was running away from real estate, but the wealthy and the rich realized everything. They they looked at it as a, in a different light. They're like, oh shit, this on discount. Like this is on the discount rack. Let me buy everything. Everybody like, oh don't 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 don't. I mean, don't uh, invest in real estate. The market is crashing. All the rich people like, let me get this. Let me get that. Let me get this. Let me get that. And then what? Is already at rock bottom. So guess what? It has to go back up. So everybody jumping on liquor and that you missed that boat already. That boat is gone. Not saying nobody can't squeeze in, but the, the possibility of you just popping off off of some damn liquor is like, I think that wave is gone. Yeah. So there's going to be some people that get in, but for majority of the people who think about doing something and you want to have a, a high success rate, it's not going to be something that already popped off. Hmm. Dope. Dope, man. All right. So my last question is leadership. And this is specifically because one, that's something that I'm constantly working on with myself, especially with my businesses and having to uh, really get to the point where I'm taking on more and more people as opposed to like putting everything on my back. And specifically, I'm asking you because I remember hearing you say something about leadership. I don't know. I can't remember where it was. Part of my podcast. Probably. Um, so I just want to hear you talk a little bit about those experiences and how you approach leadership because it was crazy to me just the fact you basically was like you were transparent where you're like eh, I ain't really know how to lead. Oh, you talking about my ink interview? Okay, oh, that's, that's what that was. About. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that right there. I just want to see that mentality, how you made that switch, and how you approach it now. Yeah. So for me, when I started my company, I knew nothing about a company. Like I said, I didn't get educated on none of this stuff. And that's why I'm a firm, firm believer in like self-education because everything I'm doing right now, I just literally learn from books, programs, mentors, and mastermind groups. Every single thing. Podcast books. Like that's everything I learned from. So, and I have a multi-million dollar company within like a year. So I knew nothing about that. So I had to study leadership. I had to read you know, how to, how to win friends, influence people. I, I had to read what, what got you here, won't get you there. And um, Goldsmith books. So it's like leaders, good leaders in, in their books and figuring out how to lead and think and grow rich book. So different things that, that develop a mindset and then realizing how to understand people, emotional intelligence. And I didn't know any of these things. So I was the person that come, came in and, and like in that interview, I was like having a conversation with my team and they did something I didn't like. And in the, in the meeting, one of my employees was like, Hey, well, I thought, you know, it was, it was, we was a team. Like I thought that this was like everybody company. And I was like, no, this is my company. 
This ain't nobody company but mine. I said, oh my God. I looked, I'm, I thought back to what I said. I was like, what was I thinking? Once I started reading these leadership books and, and taking these leadership programs and things like that, I was like, wow, I fucked up. <laughs> right? I'm like, and if you want to edit that part, I messed up. Right? <laughs> and, and basically, and basically, I realized that in order for you to lead a team correctly, they have to feel a sense of ownership. So if they don't feel like they're a part of it and you're not giving them credit, I used to take all the credit. I used to post stuff and like, yeah, I'm killing it. And know my team. I knew my team did it. I know I didn't do it, but I come in and like, cause I'm the face. So I'm just like taking, like, I'm just showing the work. Like, I'm like, yo, we up here killing it. Like I'm out here. Ki-. And I'm not even like giving no credit or anything like that. So then yeah. I realized that people want their credit. People want their praise and people want self uh, sense of ownership. So once I realized that I started praising my team for things they did. I don't care how small it is. If it's a win, it's a win. And I'm celebrating. I have the whole company celebrated together. We in a clapping, cheering, high-fiving every single accomplishment just to get everybody morale up and, and keep that up, right? And giving them credit for things they do. If they got a page that they grew to a million followers, hey, if it was if it was Josh, it's Josh. If it was Autumn, it's Autumn. If it's Martha, it's Martha. Like whoever whoever it is, give them their praise. That's who did it. That's part of my team, tagging them. This the person, like, because that's what it's about. It ain't about me, because at the end of the day, I'm just the CEO. They have to run the ship. You know, they all I could do is steer the ship, but they have to paddle and, you know, get the ship to where it got to go. So if they down and not inspired, then there's only so much I can do from the top. They got to put the work in. So you have to give them their credit, and they have to understand that this is our vision. This is our vision together right? I'm just the CEO. But at the end of the day, you know, the vision that we're coming up with together, right? This is our vision. This is what we believe in. This is our uh, values. This is our mission. This is when we go left, we go left together. When we go right, we go right together. Everybody lead together. Uh, Mm -hmm. Jacko, uh, Extreme Ownership is a great book too. And what he said in that book was uh, Jacko, um, he basically said, is no such thing as a bad team, only a such thing as a bad leader. So when he said that, I thought about it like, wow. Because he had an example in his book. He was like, one one boat, they had like a boat race and boat one or whatever. I don't know the numbers of the boat, but boat one kept losing, coming in last place. And then boat two was killing it. Boat two was killing it every single time. And boat one was blaming it on his people. Like, yo, they not paddling hard enough. They not doing this. They not doing that. You know, and they kept coming in last. And then he was like, you know what? He took boat one and he gave the lead, the, the person who was leading the ship to boat two. And the person that was on boat two went to boat one. And what he did was he basically was encouraging them and pushing them. It was like, you got this, you got this, like, go, let's go. Coming up with a, screen, a, a strategy as a team and, and, and everything he did was, was learn from his mistakes. He took the ownership when things went wrong and, and he really started pushing his team. And then boom, all of a sudden, boat two started coming in third place and boat one that was last came in first. Mm. So it just proves that it wasn't, it was the same people but different leaders. Yeah. And then when, then when you realize that, wow, he motivated his people, he, he inspired his people, you know, he, he gave the credit to his people. He took ownership for when things went wrong because I used to be the person to point fingers in my company. Oh, it's your fault. It's your fault. But in reality, if you really look at anything that has to do with my company is my fault. If you're not doing your job, if you missed a, a, a meeting, or if you're not, you know, uh, Giving, sending out reports. If you're not, that means it's something missing. So I go to my team and how can I help you? How can I help you more? What can I do to make this better? Right? What tools do you need? Maybe they don't have enough tools. And I figure out what do they need. And then I, I help them, you know, I help them out and, and I give them, I give them support and I take ownership when things go wrong. No matter what, because if they didn't send that email out, maybe I need a system in place to make sure they can send that email out on time and figure out what I need to do as the leader to fix that issue for them. Got it. That's dope, man. That's 
Yeah, that's that's dope, man. I love that perspective, especially since you were on one end and, and shifted. I think that's more powerful than actually just being in one place the whole time because you understand both sides and what's required to transition. To see your own fault and transition is even even uh, more powerful. Um, hey, man. Well, thank you again, everybody. I hope you guys are inspired by and just just his path, your journey, right? Because I want to commend you of this self-education, right? The, the self-awareness to realize the lack of skills you have in some places to and then be able to go get those skills or be able to identify where those skills take place and then actually achieve, and that, which is that that is a muscle, that's a science and journey individually and internally in itself. So I definitely want to commend you for that. And I definitely hope everybody can take those things away from this interview. Uh, once again, as you guys know, as always, this video is brought to you by BrandManNetwork.com. Because I signed myself, if you like this video, go ahead and like it. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do.